I think it's interesting because I'm now also, I'm 12 years in and, and my friends who are either VCs or in music or film, we always speak about what is the talents that we love and what is the people that we really remember having had a meeting with. And ultimately they're all very similar types of people. They're just an inherent vision, drive and almost cohesiveness. Um, even though it might be a unique logic that's only logical to that person, it somehow makes complete sense as you encounter that person, um, mixed with an enormous amount of talent and an ambition that you feel like if I'm not getting on that train, the train is leaving anyway. So, you know, I, I will just be missing out on an incredible ride. Um, and I think most talented people will share that kind of personality. And that is the reason why we, Side the company is saying that we wouldn't invest in art, but we'd invest in artists because I remember that first meeting with all my talents. And now we have a selection committee. It's not me who's kind of heading this, but you see it and and you see it with other talents. Um, it's really like a flame and it's very romantic to describe it as that. But you feel like if you throw, you know, 10 things in the face of that person, they will still be standing. Um, there's a mm -hmm. real strength in the... Today, we're talking with Marine Tongi, CEO of MT Art Agency, the first talent agency across the globe for visual artists. Marine was awarded the Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2018. She was awarded the UK Entrepreneur of the Year for the 2019 NatWest Every Woman Awards and has produced two TED Talks, one on how to transform cities with art and another on how social media visuals affect our minds. Today, we'll be talking about how visual artists can use the power the power of digital to build a business around their art. And just quickly before we get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Welcome, Maureen. How are you? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm as excited as a Monday evening will be. So thank you so much. You're going to brighten up my week now. Yeah, that's right. And so just for the listeners, uh, so this is being recorded in Australia. So it's like 7.30 in the morning and Maureen is in France. Um, and it's 10.30 at night. So um, the power of the internet continues, you know. Um, but let's just get straight into it. So why did you choose this specific industry? Because it seems incredibly difficult to break through and to market uh, visual art. I mean, that's a really good question. Why did I choose it? I think I'm very romantic about it. I think I was, I don't think I chose it consciously. I think, you know, I've been doing it since I'm 19 years old. I was a young Gary director of Steve Lazaridis who discovered Banksy and J.R. when I was 21. So I'm now 12 years in um, and I've basically grown into a sector. Um, I think the, the why is I am more of a visual person, a visual brain than I am a word brain. Um, ironically, I, I relate to the world through visuals. I connect to people through visuals. I have a very strong visual memory as well, much more than um, a word memory. And, and I felt that therefore, that was the way I connected more easily um, to any topic that I found interesting. And, and I wanted to be surrounded by people who used those visuals brilliantly, who were very talented in them and, and somehow add value to them and, and have other people see that. So I think that's kind of, me relating and connecting to visuals when I was like 10 years old, 15 years old, with no mm -hmm. idea what that job could be. Mm. Um, but I was very driven to visuals. I can't really explain why. Is when I do um, any form of IQ test, my visual memory is always much higher than anything else. So I was mm -hmm. obviously just a brain that was very shaped towards visuals. Yeah, sure. And so you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but left uni and you ran your own art gallery at the age of 22. Is that right? So I, I'm a double dropout. Um, double dropout. Sorry, I got that right. <laughs> I thought being a single dropout was way too easy. A big, yeah. I, was, I think I was very principled. I still am, but I think I've learned um, to convey principles in ways I can bring everyone together behind it. I think when I was younger, I didn't really understand how to do that. Um, but I therefore... Well, what do you mean um, by that quickly? Like principles I, how I, I think I just saw everything in 
whether I agreed to the idea, I would stick to it. And if I didn't agree to any form of the idea, I would leave. Um, I was very um, binary um, as a kid, as a teenager, as, as a young person in her 20s. And I didn't like the way um, with Sean's now so arrogant, but sadly that's the way I was in my early 20s. I didn't like the way history of art was taught. I thought it was dead. Um, I thought you couldn't really connect with the artists. You couldn't really connect with the visuals. Um, and and so I therefore express that and and drop out, which obviously is very obnoxious. Um, but it kind of shaped me to be an entrepreneur because then I just I basically went on to do every single thing I felt was the right thing to do and and took enormous risk um, on the back of it. So I was a young Gary director for Steve Lazaridis when I was 21 in London. I then got poached by an investor who was based in Los Angeles, who had an advertising company two years on from that, and Hanwell and Gary in Los Angeles. And then after having met Mike Horowitz, um, who had built CAA, then therefore decided to drop again on my um, partnership to build the first heart agency in the art world. I think, you know, it's a mix of ignorance and it's also a mix of being absolutely non-compromising is the answer because I just, you know, every time I had the most incredible opportunities and I was in a very privileged position, uh, but it didn't feel quite right until it felt right, which is the company I've built. Um, and ever since I've been someone that has built foundations, got people to join it and and got to scale it. You know, I've been the opposite personality since I found what I wanted to do. But I think until until then, I refused to commit to any ideas that I wasn't fully into. Mm-hmm. And you started, um, you chose to start an agency for artists. Why did you choose that specific um that specific business i think so again i think the early part of my 20s to the first six years into the art world are you know i'm definitely very competitive as a personality and and i wanted i wanted to understand how the sector was working so i was striving to get to the top positions to understand how this was turning um but then as i ran this gallery in beverly hills and and as i was starting having not only you know, a good reputation, a level of um, sales, a level of everything I would have wanted. It just didn't feel right still. And when Michael Levitz told me how he built CAA, and I was lucky to therefore start to be mentored by him when I was 23, I was just really interested in how he saw talents as something much more human than the sector. So the, the sector sees art as a dead object that is almost this luxury items. Um, mm. It's very much devoted to the creator in some ways. Um, the the way he perceived talent in the music, film, and acting sectors felt much more fluid. It felt um, human. It felt you could extrapolate many things from just a single person. Like mm-hmm. your actress was not just doing a top movie. She was also... Um, having an amazing brand campaign. Uh, she will have a very powerful um, um, communication strategy. There was so much more to her than just what she was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just felt like you could do this with visual artists. And, and I don't know how much you know about the talent sector, but sportive used to be really underappreciated up until the 80s, 90s. And now, you know, you would never think of a sportive as an underappreciated talent. Like they are you know, people you want to sign, people you want to build the carry off. And mm-hmm. and I felt this was um, the visual artists I really loved, deserved the same thing. And also because I, am very, I have very strong liberal um, and left-wing political views, I felt therefore it would help um, building a new stream of revenues behind talents, which meant that all type of talents could become talents in an overtly privileged sector. Mm -hmm. And also that I would help to bring new urgencies through bringing new types of revenues to my talent. So it it was really kind of a very satisfying moment because the economics and the social values just aligned in a way that just I didn't expect them to make sense because my sector is, you know, very high net worth driven. And my views are much more left wing. So I, did, I never expected them to come hand to hand. And actually, 
the, the solution fund um, behind the agency got the economics and the social values to completely kind of meet and, and to be the strengths of one another, which felt amazing. And subsequently, mm-hmm. we also became the first B Corp company um, in the art world in the UK on the back of this. So I think we continued yep. that stories through that. Okay. And so, I mean, let's jump to the artist side of things because I'm really interested in actually um, how you market an artist effectively and all the revenue streams and so on. But let's start at the very beginning. Um, how do artists traditionally promote themselves? You know, before a company like yourselves, I'm like mm-hmm. an agency for artists um, is there. You know, so what or how do artists promote themselves so being traditionally? Business, traditionally. Yeah. It's drastically evolved. Obviously, in the 80s, 90s, you would be lucky to be exhibited on a wall. And that would be the only way you would be perceived um, in the world, um, because that was the only way someone could interact with your work. That if you were displayed on the walls of a gallery, on the walls of a museum. Um, Of course, my generation of artists has kind of had it, I think, in a much better way, because suddenly with social media, you could tell your story. And you could be seen by much larger audiences, even if you didn't have access to a wall, um, Mm -hmm. which meant you could include countries that were before this not included. You could include backgrounds that before this were not included. So the the communication side, I think, really kind of changed everything. And I think not to forget as well that PR agencies in the sector are very expensive. So it's also democratized the access on how you could tell your own story. Um, which I think is very powerful. Mm-hmm. I think that what, where we really make a difference is, you know, we, so I look at every artist as a 360 strategy. I think every single one of them wants to be completely different of what the strategy they would want. So we completely tailor it to them. But I think to kind of give you major achievements, which I nobody else can do in the sector. So we closed the Sean Mars in Paris, which is 800 meters long, um, with the Eiffel Tower, 30 companies, the mayor of Paris, and had this 800 meters, basically the longest public art painting in the world with our artist SAPE. SAPE, when you had this, was 29, just made it to the Forbes 13 or 30, then had this. No galleries in the sector could have got in this. And mm-hmm. it's a completely new type of deal where you have, back to the inspiration of CAA, but you have partnerships and packaging behind talents Mm -hmm. where here you have a media partnership. You have 30 companies financing it. You have a public public, um, office like the mayor of Paris backing it. So we will package very powerful deals which enable suddenly much larger audience, but also a much uh, bigger ambition than I think this kind of talents is used to have. Okay, so just to just to clarify, so before <laughs> our social media, you needed to be up on a gallery, right? Um, but but that yeah. was the way in predominantly, and then probably mostly with Instagram, it feels um, that that kind of opened up the visual artists um, to have um, kind of exposure to audiences that they didn't have before. But that still doesn't close the loop on actually how they make money from this whole thing, does it? That's like they're getting an audience. Um, but they're not generally creating um, enough revenue to live off oftentimes. Is that a true statement or is that not a true statement? I think yes or no. I think social media was powerful. Is again, your story was told by other people. You couldn't tell your your story in the first place. Um, So that's a game changer. And I think even someone like me, so 90% of the sector comes from very privileged backgrounds. The fact that I don't, but I could tell my story and get people to back me is I think an example of what social media can bring in, in a time like this. Mm-hmm. Um, the revenue, I think is, well, I agree that audiences don't do everything, but in the case of the public art project, I gave as an example, and you know, my first boss was spotted Banksy and JR, their audiences became their strengths. It became their their worst as well and their values. So they can have a Cannes festival or cities committing to doing project with them in the case of JR because of the audience that they have. So I think audiences are incredibly powerful and in all talent sectors, they are really, it's thanks to the agency that the talents have their power as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you have all the agents and they put together like all these um like events and so on. And so that's another core component, right? And so your approach is taking it 
to like another level, like for example, um, the project that you did in Paris. But are there yeah. other examples of these types of projects where, you know, it puts it together and it creates something which wasn't there before? Yes, I think the way we build them, there's four different arms on how we build them. There's the arms of the traditional arm, which is selling their works, getting museums to back them. Then you have the communication arms, making sure everyone knows that the next rising star that would just ever be seen as such. The third arm is the public art. So a public art deal can be up to half a million and million plus. So this is not just organizing uh, organizing an event, you know, it is breaking ultimately a partnership with a city, a government or multiple public bodies, which is very financially viable um, for artists at that level. And that's the reason why we're able to get artists from very prestigious traditional models because they can't get this anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the brand collaborations, which were also very new for the past few years, where suddenly we did a partnership with the Californian company Method and over 1 million projects with three artists and them that we had put on all their bottles, sold within just three months in the UK supermarket. So the idea of generally bringing up to the shelves of supermarkets, which is completely disrupting because the same artists will be exhibiting at Christie's mm. and selling for thousands of pounds per works. So I think I just had, and I think it was back to kind of, you know, I have been raised by a traditional sector professionally to start with. So in a sense, I've had six years in a traditional sector. So I'm able to have a partnership with Christie's, which we've had. I'm able to understand how collectors work. I'm able to develop networks that will back the artists. But equally, I never wanted to just be in the luxury side of things for them. I wanted to make sure we could position mainstream deals, which I believe in the long term will be much more valuable revenue-wise and reputation-wise than the luxury ones. Um, mm. And that's what's starting happening because, because the audiences are much larger and because suddenly they become much larger role models, people that you look up to, people that you're inspired mm-hmm. by. They are actually much more game-changing for their carriers than just a pure luxury market. And I think from a luxury market perspective, um, um, it's a lot more subjective and there's a lot fewer kind of art collectors than there are companies who want to have a cool kind of imagery on some promotion. Right. So like, yeah. it seems like you're like, disrupting the traditional way that art is are distributed, you know? So before it was like, you know, it was very exclusive and now it's becoming, you know, just more, um, I guess, accessible um, to like a lot more people. Like, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think what I'm excited, I'm not excited about the art world. I'm excited about a visual sector in which the urban realm, the advertising sector belongs to that. And I want to share for visual talents um, in that visual sector. I think you right now have never consumed so many visuals in your entire life than in the past 10 years. <laughs> you consume visuals constantly. They're everywhere. They mm. are you know, on the ads digitally and artists has so few shares um, of those visuals. And the advertising sector knows it is the key to get to your brain. In two seconds, if they use visuals, they will get you to think something much faster than if they speak or if they put a word to it. Mm. And yet, you know, visual artists barely tap any revenue from this. They don't get any shares or any voice really within mm. this sector. And they're still confined to something that's really conservative, a bit broken because almost two thirds of galleries were already not making money before COVID um, and, and just outdated and not mm. like a language, it's just very outdated as objects in the yeah. luxury space. Okay. Um, let's jump to the revenue yeah. models now, right? Because yeah. I'd like to understand, um, you know, how do artists or how can artists actually make money these days? Yeah, so I think, so when I built the business, it was essential. First, we were one of the few business to be profitable from day one. And that was essential in a sector where most of my competitors are acquiring social status or are non-regarding to whether or not they're making money. And that was the same way in which we therefore wanted our artists to be very sustainable financially. I think, again, the economics for us for us is very much the vehicle to change. So they have to be empowered economically and, and we have to be doing well economically because that is what we believe to be also the change within otherwise a sector that's very stuck in. Mm-hmm. So I think revenue streams is really equal from 
public art projects to art sales to brand collaborations to um, communication deals. So Delphine Diallo, one of my um, Brooklyn um, based photographer, just got the Chanel Number no. Five contract to rethink um, the impact that Chanel Number no. Five had. So reshaping the idea of the perfume and retaking the idea that I don't know how much you know about Chanel Number no. Five, but the the founder Gabriella Chanel was very disruptive in her time. And she was collaborating with tons of artists um, when she launched it and kind of going back to those principles. So that would be also bringing that kind of deal. Equally, we booked on multiple editorial shoots um, with Condonas at the same time and the Gap Group too. Um, equally, she had a 12 meter exhibition in central London for 10 months that was supported and paid for by the Crown Estate um, and Westminster um, in central London. She was also on advertising screen in the, in the center of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, meanwhile selling art and just recently been seen at um, an auction run by ex Sotheby's and therefore in the art newspaper. So that's an example. That's all us, you know, connecting the dots. It's a bit like when you go on the website of William Morris, um, they have their name and then there's all connected dots. Mm. Our brains are the same. You know, you just have a name of an artist and then you just connect the dots everywhere and you just make sure that every single person or key person in your network that will be relevant to them is connected and revenue is being derived at every angle of this. So that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, one of the things um, um, that I read was that when you take on an artist and you get over 200 applications a month, um, if I'm correct, is that right? Oh. Very good reading, very good research. <laughs> yeah, um, is that you give them some money every month to be able to to live and to do art. Is that correct? Yeah, so the thinking was twofold. Um, I don't have parents who are business people. My mom is a primary teacher, my dad is a sport teacher. So I was trying to think, how can I build foundations where my business is safe for the years to come and I can do absolutely what I love um, meanwhile, obviously have something that I can scale with this. So my thinking was I need to have somehow a business that is cash flow based, but also asset based um, so that I can basically be ultra safe um, mm. and as I want to kind of scale. So the cash flow was all the revenue streams I gave you. The asset that was like, well, my artist need is a constant support and a constant financial support. If I found a way through the cash flow to be able to back them every month on their studio and production costs, in exchange, they will give me a work per year. If they dump me after a few years because we've done a great job or because something else happened, which I don't wish for because that's mm. the worst case scenario, but let's say they become major and they dump me, I don't want to be in a position, a position where business-wise, this is something that would impact me. I want to be in a position where that's only going to be sad emotionally, but professionally, we can celebrate it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the value of our corporate collection was built on. So we have 267 works right now that we own from artists we've backed, um, from artists we have now seen the markets really rising since. Um, so for instance, like an obvious, which were the first um, AI artwork ever sold at Christie's in 2018 for half a million, we would have mm -hmm. a work of this. So we have a, a collection that basically keeps on growing in terms of value. Mm. Um, and it means that I can resell any of this works to resupport the rest of the artists if something was to go terribly wrong. Mm. If not, it means that we just have, you know, an exponential corporate collection that is incredibly valid in the contemporary landscape. Um, and then we can decide next what we want to do with this. Ironically, this has also become a source of revenue, but that was definitely non-planned because yeah. we've had loads of people who wanted to borrow from that collection. But that's this is where the who want to business. borrow the art and who will pay you exactly. a rental fee. Yes, yeah, so we've had a lot of these inquiries. I don't believe in rental of art as a business because I think the logistics and the admin are too expensive to pull okay. this business forward. Okay. Um, but I think because we own the assets and because we already insure them and therefore the logistics is minimal, yes. um, we've actually been able to derive a lot of revenue from it but completely by accident because that was mm -hmm. never um, that was never part of the thinking. But the UBP, which is one of the few um, large-scale privately owned bank, for instance, mm -hmm. will be borrowing the corporate collection on a regular basis. 
Oh, great. And so you've created like, um, what are they called? Um, um, like a Y Combinator, but for artists, right? They can come, uh, they get paid, they have to give you, it's not a percentage of their company, but it's a piece of art every year, right? Which is like, um, it's like an investment like, and a return uh, thing. Um, it's their time, but then they get to focus on what they do. The two of you are connected a lot more um, financially and it seems like a very smart strategy. And obviously this has started a few years ago now. So now you've got 267 um, pieces yeah. of art. So you've been doing this for a while now. Yeah, I think it's, so we've been together, we've been um, as a company for the past five years. I mean, we've had an exponential growth for the past year also because I've had three entrepreneurs selling their companies to join me, which has made a huge difference. Okay. Um, but the, but yeah, it's like an early stage. I mean, I think we've borrowed CAA as a model, B Corp, because we are definitely left wing and um, the early stage understanding of backing brains, um, yeah. which to an extent CAA does anyway, they back brains. Um, so I think we kind of an inspiration from the three angles, but I think early stage VCs definitely see themselves in what we do yeah. in terms of how we act, how we recruit, how we back. Um but ultimately, it's about believing in in backing people. Like mm. that's just basically just you know being confident in spotting the right personality, spotting the right talent, and mm -hmm. and benefiting from having spotting that person and being trusted for that value as well. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's um, super smart strategy. Um, I like um, smart business models and smart thinking. I think that's yeah. extremely smart um, and like very hard to compete against. Sorry? It feels like very. It, it feels like a cooking recipe, right? Because it just feels like we put everything in a pot, and suddenly it happened, and it worked out, which is really yeah. nice. Suddenly it happened, like you know, just insert um, about a ten years of extremely hard work and grit, yeah. Um, yeah. and then it suddenly happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, let's just jump now to like the marketing side of things, right? Because I'd really like to understand, you know, from an artist perspective, like what are some of um, the things they need to be doing, right? Um, you know, so what does like an artist's marketing strategy look like these days? Is it a combination of, say, social media, a, a portfolio site? Like, could you speak about that, please? Yeah. So I think, you know, and you would know that yourself from having a podcast as well, it all depends on really how, which audiences you want to be seen by and what story you want to tell and what reputation you want to build. So they mm. all are building quite a separate reputation. Um, you have many more tools um, that you used to have um, social media is very important in terms of access to audiences, access to potential uh, partners and buyers as well. In reality, as we all know, nothing bits a New York Times article. Like the mainstream press is still incredibly relevant. Um, yes. And you can have all the social media following in the world if you're not backed by people from your sector you know, this could be a stop at, at some point um, from how much you can do from that. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, like all other agents, and maybe that's the reason I've lost my voice, but you spend your life um, generally just meeting people, mm -hmm. um, making sure the right stories are heard at the right time by the right journalists, um, making sure that therefore they will be pitched to those people. The story will be written in the way you want it to be written. Mm -hmm. um, and that the artist will therefore start having more credibility. I think the, the, I always think, how can we give them credibility, visibility and revenue? Marketing is sitting between credibility and visibility. You want to enlarge your audiences, but you also want everyone at the top to take them seriously. And that, and you need both. Um, I think it's positive because when I started social media was very poorly seen. Anything that was large audiences was actually poorly seen. It was seen as um, cheapen your brand and speaking to the masses was obviously a, the very wrong idea, which was still one of the few sectors where you could say that openly was mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. discriminatory. Mm. Um, and I think obviously now they've realized this was a terrible mistake, which it is. Um, and and I think it's already perceived as like you have to do this more, but there's still a form of snobism on, you know, if you have to look like you work hard at it, this is still being, you will still be looked on at um, from a sector where ultimately most people don't have to look at 
well, they don't have, they don't have to look, they work hard at all because most of them don't have to work very hard. So it's, it's, there's still um, a difference of background between the guys who have to really hustle and craft and the guys who don't have to do that. And social media is usually used by people who have to hustle because they don't come from the right background then they need the large agencies to support them. Mm. Um, whereas I think the more privileged background still tends to be slow to get it and kind of be a bit snob about it to that extent still. And I think, I mean, the focus I think for this podcast is more people that are self-made um, and that like haven't come from, I guess, as, as a privileged background and have to go through the hard um, the hard path, you know, the hard kind of hustle path. And so from that perspective, um, you talk about hustle and you talk about, you know, to get the audience large enough so the agencies actually care about you because now they've understood that actually that following actually has a lot of relevance these days, depending on how big it is. But there's also the thing where you can't be seen to be pushing too hard because then that would devalue you, right? Like if you're trying to push it too hard. So how do you balance that? I mean, I don't know because... I've always been keen as a bunny and tried way too hard. And <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's been judged upon like for years. I was told I was too ambitious. I was told, I was told so many things personally as an entrepreneur, obviously not as an artist that I don't think I care that much about all these things. I'm just, mm -hmm. I know the sector will still do, but you know, the sector is changing drastically as we speak. And I think, you know, I'm just, I'm now at the stage in my life where I would be happily playing all, play all sorts of communication strategies if my mm -hmm. artists can get what they want. I don't mm -hmm. mind. I really believe in what they do and I think they deserve it. So mm -hmm. um, my team will be feeling that it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like we'll just do it. Um, of course, not anything that's morally compromising, but making sure that any communication angle is, is kind of executed. Um in the way that hustle is looked down on pound, I think, you know, again, that's choices. I think if you're someone that wants to be seen and praised purely by the traditional market, then yes, you can't look like you hustle too much. Is that the future of the sector? I'm not sure. Do you even want to be praised by people who ultimately um, disdain most people who are like you um, is a question that I'm not sure. Mm. I mean, I personally... Uh, you know, in the same way that you were saying about self-made, but I guess I've never really, my role models were never people who were part of that. Um, as much as I respect them now and work with them, I think it's not who I aspire to be either. Mm -hmm. um, I think you do at some point have to make a decision, which is because we're building a reputation with who you might, who might love you, who might like you, who might dislike you, but who, and within the guys that might dislike you, who you need to turn around because it's essential you do because you need them mm -hmm. and who you're okay to just let it go because I might never like you and that's okay as well. So I think that always comes within communication strategy. Um, all my artists are ultimately pushing pretty strong messaging, pretty strong personalities. They're not going to be loved by everyone. And I think them understanding that this is most likely the audiences that will help them get there. I think mm -hmm. as the sector is really changing and more people are integrating it, it's smarter to just accept that that crowd will push them more than this one. Mm -hmm. And then we can just work and get as many more people as needs be over time as well. Mm -hmm. So that over time it evens out to almost everyone backing them, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Um, so maybe we can talk about this part of it because it does link in. I'm trying to understand the artists, right? There's this traditional visual of the starving artist, right? Um, that is just about the art, is so creative, and you know, but then everything else is just gone, right? Is but that's not actually the case, is it? You know, so what is like an artist these days? You know, so what kind of person or people? Or, it's such a hard question to answer, I'm sure. But you know, how would you describe? You know, who are the artists like in the 2020s? What kind of people are they? It's a very, for me, um, I think the conception you, you put forward was basically constructed so that patron of the arts could exist. You know, you always need victims so that you can have patrons and vice versa. They coexist, mm -hmm. right? Um, and ultimately, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, um, you had an upper class and aristocracy who wanted to be seen as patron of the arts. 
if they're equal, they can't be patrons because if the person doesn't need them, then obviously they can't be saints or saviors, right? It just defeats the whole Hollywood story about it. Mm. Um, and so all these stories was created so that it would reflect that well on the guys would then save them as poor artists. Um, mm. Because if someone is, again, an equal to you, you don't have to be playing that role. My artists are not poor artists. Um, they're smarter than us and they drive us and we're equal in many ways. Um, we're completely a team um, in mm -hmm. the way we work together. And I don't think I'm above them. And I don't think any of my team thinks we're above them. And we don't save them either. We just think we're lucky to be working with someone who is really talented and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, it's a really clever construction to make sure that you can have almost this hierarchy, like all mm. clever constructions, right? That preserves hierarchy most of the time politically. Um, so I think in reality, Picasso's, when you read his letters, was incredibly financially savvy. Leila da Vinci, very financially savvy. Michelangelo, very financially savvy. Um, obviously, Andy Well, as we all know, was mm. also a businessman, you know, so it's it's just not true. And That's it's great. been demonstrated over time that it was not true. The first artworks really were, were commissioned by the church, which acted almost as a business because you even had contracts where they had to agree upon principles of what the artworks would actually look like. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like a business kind of consultancy in a way. Um, so I just never believed in all of this. And I think it's, I said so much as like a construction to make sure that they stay lower because the less rights an artist have in our sector, the better. They don't have royalties. Most of the sectors have much better royalties. There's mm. a legal right to have royalties, but no one applies it. Um, there's also, um, they, they, you know, they're poorly credited when most of their works are going up. Like they just, they just have really shit contracts as well. Like it's perfect. The least knowledgeable someone is, the lower they are, the more you can control them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you keep and preserve the idea of poor little artists who know nothing outside of his craft or, or her craft, then yeah. that's perfect because you can manipulate the hell out of that person. In reality, um, I think, first of all, I don't think anyone can be born out of fresh air. Um, even when you are born out of fresh air purely, you're still connected to society around mm. you and that in incredibly impacts you. Yep. Um, and so you cannot, I mean, art for art's sake, which is a philosophy that has majorly influenced the thinking you were pushing forward, is actually a French philosophy from the 19th century, which was pushed by Corby. The French dropped this philosophy, the English kept it. Um, and it's just one of those beautiful philosophical, ideological ideas. But realistically, for you to live outside of society is literally impossible mm -hmm. um, unless you just, as you know yourself, try to be a desert. But even then, you might want to build <laughs> something. You might want to be yeah. connected. Like It's just not visible um, in its practicalities. So I think to then um, put it back to the art, the art is a response. The art, the materials, everything are being created by the society in which the artist lives in. And all of this is conditioned by the place that you're born in. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I, my hope is actually that as now the sector is more open and more international and more diverse, that the artists of that generation will be successful, will show that diversity. They will be coming from everywhere, discussing things that I hope will be very complementary mm -hmm. and, and not have a single way to look at the world because that would show that the world is much more open from the visual sector perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that will be the same movement in the same way that you had with the Impressionist movement. Um, and I would hope it's an explosion of individualities, cultures, backgrounds, diversities, um, ultimately plenty of talents, um, but very strong, um, yeah, very strong complementarities in terms of the art as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that you explained that because that's what I thought, but I just wanted to really put it out there because it's still, it's still very strong that, you know, that, the misconception about kind of the artists of the world, you know, like and how they are. Um, but let's just jump quickly um, to what makes a great artist because, you know, you get hundreds of applications per month, right? Um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands more out there. Some can break through, others cannot. But before they break through, you know, 
they need to have something, right? And so what is that something? I think it's interesting because I'm now also, I'm 12 years in and, and my friends who are either VCs or in music or film, we always speak about what is the talents that we love and what is the people that we really remember having had a meeting with. And ultimately, they're all very similar types of people. They're just an inherent vision, drive, and almost cohesiveness. Um, even though it might be a unique logic that's only logical to that person, it somehow makes complete sense as you encounter that person. Um, mixed with an enormous amount of talent and an ambition that you feel like if I'm not getting on that train, the train is leaving anyway. So, you know, I, I will just be missing out on an incredible ride. Um, and I think most talented people will share that kind of personalities. And that is the reason why we started the company saying that we wouldn't invest in art, but we invest in artists because I remember that first meeting with all my talents. And now we have a selection committee. It's not me who's kind of heading this, but you see it and, and you see it with other talents. Um, it's really like a flame and it's very romantic to describe it as that, but you feel like if you throw, you know, 10 things in the face of that person, they will still be standing. Um, there's a mm -hmm. real strength in the, in the determination that they have. And, and that is, as again, being romantic about it, I think that is what's seductive about people because mm -hmm. you want to be on a ride with someone that's going to overcome everything and through talent and through being smart and through being inspiring because, I think there's very few reasons to why life is worth living than actually having those great stories. And on the top of this, being on very exciting rides for it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's basically what an artist does. And you can pick it up. It's really, it's a confidence that's not an arrogance. It's just a real strength to, you know, they're going to be doing this for the next 40 years. Um, and then you can choose or not to be a part of it, but you know, it will happen. Sure. So I like to relate it to things I understand, which are founders of businesses are like mm -hmm. yourself. You seem extremely determined. You have some talents and through that you're creating something and you, um, uh, what's the word? You're very determined. I don't think anybody can stop you. And so you look for things like that within your artists. And so the artists are like, um, it's like you're investing in the founders of a company. Like this is the best way I like to think about it, right? Like, and it's about the people. It's not about the idea. It's about the people and it's about how determined are they? Like, and how willing are they to go all the way? And that they're going to do this regardless if you're involved or not, right? And that's it. And apart from that, like everything else is more flexible. Is that right? It's more subjective. Yeah, and there's a sentence that... Michael Ovid said 10 years ago now that really resonated in me when he said, I collect brains. And I loved when he said this because I always felt like a great collector of brains, obviously alive people, but still. Like, <laughs> obviously like, alive I, people. <laughs> I don't want to feel like any form of morbid, although I'm obviously a very avid reader, but yeah. still um, sure. like actual living people. Yes. And, and I think when he said this, it was quite interesting because he said this and I still remember because I was in his house and there was a library and there was the way he was speaking about talents and it was really going on the hunt for the smartest people he could find. Um, and, and it's interesting because I think if you kind of look at his careers and, and look at what CA was able to achieve, one time they were able to win a contract against uh, McCann uh, for Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. McCann had, uh, the advertising agency had a ridiculously large team they were very small still. Um, and they still wanted because the ideas were great, the brains were smart. And and I think in a room you can always sense this. And I have a strong belief in that. And I've been in many rooms now where we've been tiny, my artists have been more, you know, sometimes younger or sometimes less established than somebody else, all this is changing. Um, but smart and and driven and mm. able to convince the crowd that they can do that. Um and, and it's just quite magical because I think if you believe in the power of brains, I think there's just, there's very little that will stop you from that. And I think also it makes life very interesting because you keep on putting brains together and ultimately you see amazing things happen out of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I have a very, it felt very liberating when he, when he said this, because I think I was coming at it when the art world underpays people, underpays the interns, 
doesn't recruit brains. We lose most of our brains to sectors that pay people better. Mm -hmm. um, and we look at artworks as such dead, dead objects that I think when he said this, that was just like, that's, you know, I'm willing to pay a team member a high price. I'm willing to pay an artist every month because I generally believe that the value is not in the object, but it's in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sentence therefore resonated it because it's the opposite. It's really back to the early stage VC is people who believe in backing people and I they think, think the value is more in that than anything else that has been built because you can see that that person could build most things from mm -hmm. this. So um, it's definitely my philosophy. I know, you know, there's all different ways to look at this, but um, but it's quite liberating because it has really worked out to be trusting in, in good brains mm -hmm. so far. And I mean, that applies across all industries, across all businesses, you know, if you invest in people, if you invest in living brains, <laughs> um, then it is definitely a good strategy. Um, now let's talk about, okay, let's say that there's an artist that is listening to this podcast, right? And they're like, hey, that sounds like me. Hey, I'm determined. Hey, I've got this. I've got that, you know. But what are the things they need to be doing, you know, per day, per week, per month, you know, in terms of uh, their online presence or their digital presence in terms of, you know, um, establishing themselves to be able to be taken seriously uh, by a company like yourself that gets hundreds and hundreds of applications, you know, um, how do people stand out like, in this very competitive space? I think the well, I think first of all, it's tough as you as you know yourself. I think it's just it's definitely difficult to stand out. I think therefore, the best way to stand out is to be technically as innovative as you can, conceptually have a story that's as unique as you can as well, um, and then match it with a very good way to approach someone. Just to when you send your story to, I don't know, like I see artists doing this copy and pasting emails or or not really kind of doing a real approach. I think just really sit down and think, I want to join. I may not have everything that's yet required, but I really think this is right. Let me explain why. Um, plus, um, show that this is really the company I want to join. This is the reason why. Um, but it, was, it comes on also to the fact that technically and conceptually just research and make sure that you are truly adding value to a sector. It's a bit like going back to companies, but if 40 companies are already doing the same, you might not be adding much value as you're creating the 41st one. Mm. Um, but it's the same with an artist, like because we look at portfolios all day, you know, we're really trying to pick people who are bringing something very new. Um, and visually you can always bring things that new conceptually. It's the same. So just make sure that you, you go in depth with that because um, that is the next rising stars are usually always people who add value to their sector, who bring something that's through a different lens, a different angle, a different context that the sector hasn't seen before. And so where do you suggest that they um, uh, host their portfolio? Is it just on a Squarespace site or like on Instagram or like anywhere, it doesn't really matter, like a website, a custom website. Like, is there anything which you say, look, I mean, that's all possible, but this is probably going to be the best thing. I don't, the thing is, I don't think we'll care that much, I think, from our end, um, is the answer. I think I think if I was a buyer or if I was a, a potential partner for them, I'm sure a very sleek website and sleek Instagram will matter. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to whether or not we want to work with an artist and we want to represent um, a talent, that's just, we don't care. I have some artists who are still only communicating through WhatsApp um, with me. Like they send everything from invoices, to lengthy contracts to vision through WhatsApp, you know? And um, Jennifer Bistro is one of our first ones, still does everything through uh, Facebook Messenger, which is so deeply irritating because she's the only one who does this. Um, so I think it's, this is not what we're looking for. Um, it's it's we're just really looking as we've because every single application is reviewed is looked at so we're just really looking for someone that's going to be so unique and yeah such a discovery i think um mm -hmm. that you really feel well i haven't seen visually or technically something like this before this is such a great story that person sounds really interesting we'd love to meet them okay and so um what about the number of followers that they have on Instagram, say for example, they have half a million followers, you know, 
Well, does that have an impact at all? You know, that kind of distribution, that kind of following to say, well, <laughs> you know, like it's not maybe as groundbreaking as I thought, but you've got a lot of people who love what you do and the engagement's high. So we'll consider it like a bit more, you know, is that a consideration? I think ultimately having good press or having social media will put that person on our radar, mm-hmm. but then the rest is still valid. And so we okay. still want to know what personality. So of course, you know, it's like being in the right room. Um, you, you, you put yourself on the radar to somebody else, which is great, um, but you still have to prove you're worse at that point as you're into the room. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll never text someone because they've got a great amount of photos or the right press. Um, I would just really, first of all, I would tag them and the team will be feeling the same way, whether we think we can back that person, whether we 300% believe in that person because mm-hmm. it's impossible otherwise to back yeah. them. Um, and because I also generally feel there's potential for what they're putting out there. Um, so it, it's, it's a foot in the I door. Think, it's a foot in the yeah, door. That's what it gives. Exactly. Them. I think it's great to be put. And also again, it's usually if they have large audiences, I would hope that they're making a great living out of what they do, which will make me very happy, whatever the next um, conversation is. Mm. Um, and I think that's fantastic. I think autonomy is really good, but after that, you know, who is going to be relevant or not for the next generation is, is a side different conversation, mm. um, which is really what we are excited about. This is who we want to work with. This is who our collectors or partners want to also be working with. Um, and that's a slightly different conversation. Um, but when it comes to, I would just be very happy for the artist. I've been in that position many times actually recently where I'm happy the person does well, but I just don't believe they're groundbreaking. Um, Mm -hmm. And we would either work from time to time on a book, on the Mm -hmm. books uh, basis or project to project basis. But I would only want to take someone that I'm generally 300% convinced or somebody else on my team is 300% because obviously we've got now a large enough team that if somebody else is really convinced, they should take that person on board. But otherwise it's just, it's a waste of time for the talent to us if that person enters and it's just because we think we can make money or they have photos. It's all great work. You, yeah. you need a real, real belief system that you can move um, mountains for this person. Yeah. Okay. And so that's on the one side of it. So on the other side, um, you know, what does ultimate success look like? You know, so, you know, so what's your goal, you know, for every artist that would be like, if we can get them all to that point, you know, and, Yes, I'm sure that everybody, you know, succeeding on the way up, but that's fantastic. But, you know, so what is like, you know, the ultimate scaling up of an artist, you know, you know like, what does um, that look like? I I mean, I think it all depends. Again, they're so different to what they want. Je- recently. Robert I mean, not what Robert- they want, but what you want for them. Let's put it that them. way. Not what they want. Yeah. Like what um, do you want for them in terms of like, like if they could all say, yes, Marine, like, you do whatever you want to do. This is this is the thing which um, is the most that we could you know could do you know for you. It's interesting because I have never really thought about that question. I think the happiest moments I have with my artists is when they when I see how much they inspire those people and when they shift narratives. And um, I get very happy when the art has triggered a new way to look at something. Um, mm-hmm. And I see people appreciating this. Um, so I think I'm probably a historical recognition for them is something that I value very highly. Um, and, and therefore having people just valuing or well, being inspired by them, seeing them as role models in the way as I see them as role models is what I value most. Um, I see money as a vehicle. So I'm always very conscious because, you know, especially as a woman where um, you have so few businesses led by women who are actually making money, you're so few in the sector who actually are viable. So I've built everything so that money wise, we never have to worry. And ultimately this is going up, mm-hmm. but I'm not doing, I'm not building a company for financial reasons. I'm building it because I generally get excited for every single one of them to be inspiring tons of people. Um, mm-hmm. And, and yeah, when, when I see 
also people re-reflecting the way they look at things thanks to the art. I get really excited when I hear about the impact they have on people's life. I get really happy. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's funny, there's a there's a Netflix series that everyone speak about calls um 10% at the minute, and it was created by a French guy. It's about to come to the Anglo-Saxon world. Mm-hmm. It's on the role of life of agents. And the guy who created it was the agent of pretty much everyone in the film sector in Europe, um, was saying he works, he used to wake up every day with the guilt and anxiety he hadn't done enough for his talents. I'm, I wake up with that anxiety because I generally believe I'm working with people who are very talented. Um, so I generally believe that they deserve, therefore, a very large recognition. Um, so my, I guess my happiness and my wish for them is that, is just to get to that recognition, to get to change the things that they wanted to change um, and to have people looking up to them as role models. Um, that's generally as basic as this. I already get to live it a tiny bit um, on, on a daily basis. I'm sure I can't wait for, for to sing on a much bigger basis, but that's very much the highlights of my job. But that's why I wake up every day with that anxiety because I think they deserve better every time. So we're really talking about impact here because, you know, you can get recognition from four people, right? Um, that's recognition, right? But what we're talking about, like, is impacting society. Yeah, like, is impacting yeah. people en masse, right? Um, to feel something, to think something, to change something, to connect with something. And it seems like how you go about it is flexible per artist. And But the options are corporate sponsorship. You know, I say, for example, the Chanel thing, there's public art, um, there's the brand that put the art like on the product that sold in supermarkets. And so you, you look for the biggest impact that somebody can have. And is that the best way to put it? Like it's about just looking for how you can get impact for people, you know, because that's where there's. I'm a sucker for great stories and I love good visual stories. And I just, you know, I, I hope that the visual stories we will get to support would change things over the over the long term. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the business is completely led so that our sector can change, uh, you know, more progressively. Um, and I think, you know, I'm very lucky that my senior team is made there for three entrepreneurs who decided to separately sell their own companies to join us. Um, and I think that's because I think the vision that we have is that that we have in common um, of really shifting the way the visual sector goes about representing talents, integrating art in all contexts, just looking at visual arts or visual language differently. Um, And I think, again, getting every time the objective financially our way to assert that this change can happen. But I think none of us are truly passionate fully on the financial side of things. All of us are just on the fact that this can constantly enable more and more shift in in the impact we want to make. So, and I think that's the reason why I was able to attract people like that, um, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, it's mm. pretty fun. Um, it's generally a 40 years commitment to come. It just, there's yeah. no, it's like all of us feels quite chill about it. I think it's now coming on to, it's a very long road, but it's, but we are at a level, I mean, not to name drop, but I had, um, I was very lucky last week to start my week with the founder of WPP, the ex-founder of WPP, Sebastian Sohel. Mm-hmm. And I'm at a stage now where, you know, I'm listening to great brains. Um, I think the visual sectors could be, could be, could be disrupted and change and be a sector. Um, and now I just want to, build the powerful businesses I've seen being built, but plug in the B Corp values and the shift that's so dear to us and, and mm-hmm. succeed that. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the artists that we push are exactly the same. All of them, if they succeed, carry such incredible narratives that not only would they be a success, but they would also be able to bring a narrative that's usually brand new for the sector. So it's just, it's really um, a war of ideas. Um, And I think all of us are much more ideas led than we are business led. Um, And in fact, you know, my degree was in philosophy, it wasn't in business. I also think that um, having a degree in business is not a guarantee that 
you'll be successful in business either, just to be clear, you know. Well, um, okay. so, just, I just have it anyway, so I can't, <laughs> I, can't I don't have well, one. <laughs> well, you're the best example of that statement. Um, just a final question. Um, so if there are some artists at the moment that are listening to you, you know, how do yeah. they apply to so work with you? So there's um, at artists plural um, as a word at mtr.agency, then Again, the selection committee will review it. I promise that every single one is being reviewed. And in fact, because all of us are Inbox Zero obsessed senior team. Me too, by the way. Love Inbox Zero. Love it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure this is very healthy, but I can't do without an Inbox Zero. As yeah. I, I, would, I, I just, I could really value the, because obviously that's the reason why we're on that podcast together because we respond to emails all the time. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I still can't make up my mind if I think this is the healthiest thing to be, um, but I am an inbox zero though. Um, but therefore, I think, as you know yourself, of inbox zero. And my God, yeah, I mean, sorry, all those guys are within five minutes, they respond to your email with mm. something to say about it. Um, you you would be surprised that the right senior team is actually looking at your email at midnight. So I think just really be careful about this. Um mm. We don't have um, a company where juniors are being dispatched to look at stuff. It's a very, you know, the senior team is very involved. And it means that like at midnight, if one of them suddenly has a ping email on top of the selection committee, they might actually look through it. Um, and so I think you need to be thinking of that um, as you email. Don't do a generate email. Don't do copy paste. Mm. Uh, then really build a story that that person um, might find relevant at that time of the night, I think mm-hmm. is the, is the advice I will be giving. I find so many emails to be so, yeah, just, you can see they haven't thought partially about who they're speaking to. And, and I understand that an artist may not need to do this most of the time, but I think when you're trying to obtain something, just try as much as, as to think, who am I actually speaking to and, and what do they, what are they trying to review when I'm emailing them? Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. And I think like, if there are any artists, I mean, this podcast is the best example of why you should work with Maureen. Um, last point, uh, if there was one thing that you want the listeners to do, a site to visit, a book to buy, something to do, what would you like them to do? That's really nice. Um, I don't want to do anything that's actually commercial on that point. So let me, I mean, this is incredibly controversial, I'm going to say then, therefore, because I know this book has got very divisive um, praise or not. But when I was um, building MTR, I was reading the famous Atlas Shrug by Ayn Rand, um, which is why my baby is called Atlas as well. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't agree to everything that Ayn Rand said. I think it's impossible to do that anyway. Um, but it's 1,200 pages of someone that generally tried to rethink 360 of a political, economical, and social model that was different, super pioneering, um, and very ambitious. And whether or not you agreed with her, I think to just actually read it, because most people haven't read it from Mm -hmm. A to Z, and see the commitment and see how she constructed it. I think if you're in the process of building something, I think it's really helpful because there's no angle she hasn't looked at as she was trying to build it. Mm. Um, And I think the point of that is not to be, do I agree or not, that's irrelevant, is almost thinking, you know, can I build a system like this in a way she also built a system like this? And I think it's one of the few books where, someone has aimed to build an entire new system. Um, Mm -hmm. And of course it's full of flaws because that's always going to be the case. Um, But I've never read a book that was that impactful. And I am sad that every dinner I go to people criticize it, but haven't read it. So I think that the advice is to really read it properly. Mm, Yeah. And and then have your hate if you want to have your hate, but just to, because I think it will challenge your brain off as you read it. Um, and even if you then decide to dislike it, it will still make your brain think of things in a different way. Yeah, and Rand, um, I mean, that book's been used by both sides, but more towards the right in the US. And so people just have just heard that name connected to specific, to specific ideologies, and they, which is kind of how the world works. Nobody does any research themselves. Everybody just listens to Facebook headlines and other commentary. And so I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, I've heard of that book. I haven't read it um so now so you've inspired me to read it as well 
Definitely. You know, again, I'm left wing, so I'm not of the right wing that has been using it on that basis. And um, and I definitely found loads of left wing points because she left, um, obviously, Russia to, to immigrate yes. to the States. So there's tons of parts that are integrated. Um, I think it's just more how incredibly ambitious someone can just reimagine a system. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason is always entrepreneurs love that because when you're building something, you have to almost rethink an entire system and you mm. have to understand. And she's the definition of disruption because she's very anti the traditional sector. Mm. She's very anti anyone who is, um, you know, not adding value in that sense. But I think it's, it's in business really interesting because you see also all the resistance and resilience required to disrupt any sector uh, mm. through that. And, Again, I think this is not to be applied to every parts of life, but I think specifically if you're trying to build something up, she's um, she's quite um, quite something, I think. And I think Fontaine's head, which is much smaller, is usually read instead, which is not good. Atlas Shrug is the only one you actually meant to read, which is much better than Fontaine's head. Atlas Shrug by Ayn Rand. Maureen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I'm um, extremely thankful that you've shared uh, how artists can actually create something spectacular in this world. And I am very impressed by the business which you've created between the assets and the revenue models and the VC early stage. Sorry? You've reviewed many, so that's a real compliment. Yeah, no, it's it's really smart. I'm sorry, I'm dying as well. (laughs) Oh, good, oh, good. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast um, and we'll talk soon. I hope so. Well, you take care and thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Growth Manifesto podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.